Hey folks, my name is Girish Valley, the host for Back to Basics for Season 3, Episode 1. We're going to be talking about finance. And we have this guest of ours, and we're going to talk about his book. His book's name is Get Off Your Ass and Manage Your Money. Yeah, that's right. Get off your ass and get your money. Now, the thing is, we always talk about money. And it's a very sensitive topic in certain, certain occasions, with certain friends, families, or anyone else. But there's one thing that we all have in common is that how do we become rich? How do we become poor? And how do we sustain ourselves and save ourselves when it comes to retirement? So our guest name is Chris Orton. And let's go and invite him and let's go and talk to him about get your ass and manage your money. So let's talk to Chris. Take care. So Chris, thank you again for coming on Back to Basics. You know, uh, I'm very, very honored for that you are here. Um, but before we start this money business, and it's going to sound funny, but the ass business of your book, uh, what does Back to Basic mean to you? Well, in the I guess in the area of finance, I think it means uh, real assets, and um, because you know when m- most most Americans are investing in something that's represented by a piece of paper. So if you if you if you own stocks and mutual funds, you have a piece of paper that that represents the ownership that you have in a company. Well, the company can go to zero. When I invest. I have real ownership in something you can touch and feel like an apartment building or like an ATM machine or a self-storage place. And those things don't go to zero. Uh, Even if they burn to the ground, guess what we can do? We can insure them. So, you know, it's kind of funny that, um, uh, this, you know, conventional investments, stocks, funds, and mutual funds, that what, that's what people call conventional Mm -hmm. and they call the thing that God made land, alternatives yeah right like there's something something weird about this but this is you know real estate's been around forever the man-made stock market hasn't been around forever so anyway that's my back to basics in that in that particular area anyway yeah yeah thank you thank you again chris for for coming here and thank you for answering that question let me let me ask you this uh and i usually ask these questions to an author when they write their book right um did the concept come first or did the title come first? Because it looks like the title is very intriguing according to your title, right? And and why those words? Because, I mean, you just mentioned ass as assets, right? But who really thinks that way? So let me ask you this. I mean, is it the, the idea or is it the title came first? No, the book came first and the title came second. Okay. So actually, actually, the in my in my file where I wrote this book on my computer, this is called my second book because I had another book that I thought was going to be my first book. Okay. And this was going to be the second one. And as I kind of went through it, I decided this. But, yeah, the, it, I had the idea to, to write the book because, you know, I'd gone through a, a financial, a finan- a difficult financial situation. I was able to pull myself out of it by investing differently in different types of assets, alternatives. And, and my path was kind of your typical learning path. It wasn't like a straight line between here and there. Hmm. It was, you know, you know, backwards and forwards and left and right. So I thought, you know, maybe after having done this for nine or 10 years, I could write it down so that people could have a more efficient way of getting there than I did. Hmm. And so that's, um, that's why I wrote, uh, that's, that was the idea for the book. And, and the title just kind of uh, uh, came to me. I was, I remember where exactly it was. I was on a walk on a trail back when I was living in Washington state. And that this just kind of dropped out of the sky, you know, and I, I thought it was, you know, you want a title to do two things. You want it to tell people exactly what the book is about. Yeah. Uh, and you want it to be a little catchy and get their attention. Of so, course. you know, get off your ass, A, with two, do- with two dollar signs representing the S's, yeah. and ma- manage your investments, why you need alternative investments. So I think hopefully I, c- I got people's attention and, and <laughs> hopefully didn't offend anybody or not too many people anyway. And, uh, and then, well, this is a book about investing differently. So. Of course, of course. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, answering that question. You know, it really intrigued me when that title came up and when I saw your name and I'm like, 
you're going to come on my show to talk about, you know, the book that you created. So let me ask you this here. Now, you said that this was technically supposed to be your second book, be became your first book. Mm -hmm. Do I want to ask what the other names were? Um, I didn't I didn't get that far in terms of but the other one was probably going to be the first book was and if I'm, I'm going from memory here it was going to be the the 10 big lies about money and personal finance something along those lines and i had a you know a whole bunch of i didn't know if it was going to be 10 or 15 or 12 but i had a, a whole bunch of uh ideas about things that people just get wrong about investing in personal finance that they would that they would think are completely uh you know rational and the right way to go of course, uh, of but course for some way for some reason i switched over to this one so Chris, thank you. Thank you again for that. So let me ask you this. Now, we can talk about the whole entire book if we want to, right? But what are the three top things that do you think that this book really helps people? And and people, they come to you and ask you that, Chris, this is an awesome book. This is a horrible book. Explain to me, what did they do? Uh, what did you explain to them, if you don't mind? Yeah. So first of all, I explain what conventional investments are and what alternative investments are. And, can, and it's very easy. Everything that's publicly traded, stocks, bonds, and mutual funds, those are uh, conventional investments. Everything else is an alternative. That would be every form of real estate, cryptocurrency, cash value, life insurance, um, uh, private equity, private l lending, all that other stuff. So that's the, the main, that's the, first of all, you got to understand that. And, and 90 plus percent of Americans are investing in conventional uh, investments through their 401k or IRA, right? And now you have these alternatives. And uh, then the second thing is, is well, why are alternatives better? So in the, in the book, I created something uh, called the hierarchy of investors. If you go back to your school days, you remember there was something called Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs, where you started okay. off and your physical needs were first and eventually you got to the top of the pyramid and it was, um, it was you know, self-actualization. Well, I created the same thing, but I put, I put conventional investments, they're so low that they're not even on the hierarchy. They're in the shadow of the pyramid and where it's dark and damp because there's nothing good that happens down there. And then as you get on the pyramid, you have all the, or the hierarchy, you have all these, um, these alternatives and I compare conventional and alternatives across 13 categories and alternatives win in like 11 out of 13. So you take things like return on investment and risk and diversification and alternatives are just better in almost every way. So what I want, mm -hmm. what I really want people to do is mainly go, oh my gosh, why wouldn't I be investing over here where everything is better in alternatives? And then finally, how do I make that bridge from where I've been, you know, my whole life and where everybody else, everybody that I know is investing in this area. And I got this crazy guy called Chris Odegaard telling me to get off my ass and do something different. So how do they, how do they navigate but, that? So those are the three things. Look, Chris, let me, let me ask you this and sorry to interrupt you. You know, when, when we say that people are understanding the, the risk, I'm going to say risk instead of alternative, right? Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's a risk to make money or lose money. How would we think out of the box when, when we try to do that? I mean, it is kind of tough because I, I think the 401ks and, and the paychecks and the incomes that we get is a safe bet, safe, right? So what are your thoughts on that? Um, well, I, I could turn that upside right down and say, well, uh -huh. The biggest risk of your 401k is you're only going to get you're only going to make about a 5% return on your money before taxes and inflation. Okay. So that's really risky. You're never going to get to financial freedom or retirement unless you have a large large amount of money uh, you can invest. So if you think about well how do you get wealthy? What are the factors? Well, one of them is how much money do you have to invest? And another one is what's the return you're going to get on your money? And when I say 5%, you know, the S&P 500 throughout its history has returned to an, has, the index has delivered about a nine something percent average annual return. But mm. the investors don't actually get that return because they're human. They go into the market, they get out of the market, they buy when they should sell, they sell when they should buy. And so studies have been done that the average investor only gets about 5% 
So I would say mm. only getting 5% on your money is one of the riskiest things you could do, right? When I'm routinely getting 25% annual yeah, returns yeah. and alternatives. But, you know, the thing is that sometimes, you know, we have to think out of the box and look at what do we need for our retirement? I mean, what is the actual amount that we need? Uh, and when do we start thinking about this? Do we uh, think about it at the age of 20 or 25 or at the age of 50 where I am today? What are your yeah, thoughts right. on that part? Well, ideally, you would think about it in your 20s because the longer time you have to accumulate that and grow that and take advantage of, you know, compounding, the better off you are. But, um, you know, we, we're all kind of programmed Everything that we see, everything that we watch, everybody that we know is investing in, in conventional investments through a 401k. So when one lone guy comes along and said, hey, that's crazy, it's pretty hard to believe that yeah. guy because you've never heard that before, you know? Yeah, but Chris, uh, but honestly, in my 20s, I don't think I was taught to go and save, even though that they told me to save, but I never did. Because right. in 20s, you think about things, you know, movies hanging out, having a beer, well, having a dance or whatever, and not think of investments and not thinking of savings. So what are your thoughts on that part? Uh, I think um, uh, the, the system that's in place today, uh, you know, the conventional investing wisdom and when, when people had pensions with their jobs and, you know, after World War II, when everything was expanding and uh, it did very well for like my parents and grandparents. I don't think it's going to do as well for the younger people. And I think they're, you know, uh, they're a lot smarter than than we were back back in the day. And I think people are starting to get the idea that this whole stock market thing, which is completely disconnected from the economy, as we have seen through COVID. OK, everything, everybody's unemployed. Nobody's going to work and stocks are still going up. Why is that? Right. So, um, mm. yeah, you, you're you're right. Uh, that that's a bigger problem, you know, how, how and who is going to educate people about this stuff. And uh, I'm doing my small part <laughs> and, I, and I have a real fondness for yeah, young yeah. people because they're, they're the people who could, who could really benefit by getting started early on a different path. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, you know, I've, I've heard uh, your other interviews that how you started this whole thing. And I think one of the books actually really intrigued you, didn't it? And can you explain to others that what that one book is, if you don't mind? Yeah, and uh, this is a uh, uh, it's Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad Poor Dad book, and um, mm. millions of people around the world have have had the same response or reaction that I had when you, when you read that book and you go, "Oh my gosh, there is a whole other way of thinking about money." that I never knew about. I never heard of it. Nobody ever taught me that. And so, yeah, uh, mm -hmm. that book and, and Robert's other book, well, he has, he has lots of books, but the two would be Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and then Cash Flow Quadrant. Um, and, and, you know, yeah. you're, you're exactly right. I mean, we just don't learn any of this stuff in school, right? And mm -hmm. so you come into the world as an adult, you know, in your early 20s, and you start working and you know, you know, the only thing you know is what you were taught in your family, which is probably right. wrong, <laughs> right? I mean, there there are different thought processes in, in different different generations, right? I mean, we 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 think in a different way. Things were different back then, Chris. I mean, you you know that, and we all know that, right? Uh, the savings were a little different versus today. Uh, we think that a uh, nine to five job is the best thing in the world, and today they don't think that way. Right. So, and that's just from an entrepreneur side of things. We're not even talking about investments. So, mm -hmm. let me ask you this: the the 401ks or the IRAs, what are your thoughts? I mean, you think that's the same thing as a as a what? I mean, what are your thoughts on that? I think they suck, to be frankly honest. Yeah. They're awful. They're awful. Okay. Okay. If, I knew in, if I knew in my 20s what I know today, I would have never put a dime in a traditional pre-tax 401k. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, so let me ask you this. What do you think the actual realistic number would be for retirement? Okay, so here, this is the, um, so this is the, this is the whole conventional, the question that you're asking is, is the, the big question that is asked in conventional wisdom, because conventional wisdom is based on saving 
and building up this mountain of money in the form of mutual funds or stocks or whatever, right? Yeah. And then yeah. so you build this up and and the and these are these are you know mutual fund stocks bonds that typically don't produce any cash flow. Mm. So you have let's say you have this million, you have mil, a million dollars in this portfolio, and then and you stop working, and then in order to generate the cash flow to pay your bills, you start selling off pieces of that mountain of money every year to pay your bills. Mm. So financial advisors uh, use something called the 4% rule. So if you, and what they say is that you can probably sell off 4% of your, of your portfolio every year, and you won't run out of money before you run out of life. So let's, but, but it's really, I think it's not the right question to ask. The real question is, what do I want my income to be in retirement? Because we can't live, we can't live on a, a mountain of, you know, of, of mutual funds. We have to have cash flow. So, so what, what do I want my income to be? So let's just, let's take an example. Let's say, you know, when you decide you want to quit your job for whatever reason, you want to have, you want to have an income of $100,000 a year. So if you apply this 4% rule um, to that $100,000 a year and do the math backwards, you need a $2.5 million 401k portfolio. And do you know how many Americans are millionaires? 8%, hmm. much less multimillionaires. So that means that this whole system uh, doesn't work for 92% of the population. It works for those 8% that are going to be millionaires or multimillionaires. And now we can say, well, maybe we're a little greedy. Maybe a hundred thousand is too much. The the median income in the United States is around sixty three thousand dollars. So if you apply the four percent rule to that sixty three thousand dollars, you still come up with a one point one point five million dollar portfolio, hmm. which again only eight less than eight percent of the population is ever going to have that much money. Right. And and now what's happened over time is that they're finding out that the four percent rule isn't really working anymore. And so now they're talking about a three percent rule. So now, if you take the, if you take that uh, that sixty three thousand dollar median income and apply the three percent rule, now you're back up to over a two million dollar portfolio. Mm. So this whole system just is is broken. Mm. So so let me ask you this: where maybe let me ask you in a different way because you said that maybe that's not the right question. So let me ask you this here, right? Do you think I should save up, let's say, I don't know, I'm, I'm coming up with a number which makes sense, it does not make sense, I really don't know, okay? 150 for my medical only, okay? Or maybe, I don't know, 180 just for, for my car repair, buy, slash, whatever, right? Yeah. Or maybe another 100 for groceries and my medicine, I mean, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, so, so yes, here's how, here's how I approach that. Everybody who's, who has a desire. And I, I always like to say that because there's nothing wrong with working. If you love what you do and you want to keep doing that until, until you can't do it anymore, that's great. If you would like to do something different because that's the thing you love and it doesn't produce a lot of money, that's okay too. So I just wanted to, I would want to get, there's nothing, certainly nothing wrong with working, but at some point people are going to want to, or maybe need to, not work anymore. So what you need, what I think the way I approach it is how many thousands, what are my expenses on a monthly basis? If I have, if I have $10,000 a month of expenses, then I need to have $10,000 a month of income. Where am I going to get that $10,000 a month? Mm -hmm. That could come from, if somebody has a job that has a pension, some of that cash flow could come from there. Uh, some people buy annuities, um, there is social security, or you have some type of an alternative asset that produces cash flow, like an apartment building or a self storage or a single family rental. So the way I look at this is how many chunks of a thousand dollars can I continue to find and stack on top of each other to come into my, you know, into my bank account every month mm. to, to fund my bills and and then all the fun stuff I want to do just beyond the basic living necessities. But but Chris, with your example, I I have ten thousand per month. Okay, mm -hmm. now I don't have extra money to go and put investment on, let's say, a, a mortgage home, which I can get rent from to make my ten thousand per uh, per month. 
So what are your thoughts on that part? So, now? so wait a minute. When you say you're saying you have ten thousand dollars a month of, ex I didn't understand your question. No, okay. Sorry. So when you when you just said that your budget is going to be a ten thousand monthly, right, for your mortgage, for your electrical, and everything else, right? Mm -hmm. I don't have extra money cash to invest on a different business or an investment as a risk to to save yourself for your future old age or elderly age. What are your thoughts on that? Well. So um, here, so I think what you're describing is, is, is a situation where you're like, so the only money that anybody has to invest is the money that's above and beyond their living expenses. So I think you're saying, okay, I, I make, make $10,000 a month, but my expenses are $10,000 a month. What am I supposed to do? Is that kind of what you're saying? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You got to make more money somewhere. I mean, you know, uh, I can't solve it. So everybody has to... So one of the, my principles is everybody needs to be the best at whatever they do. So whatever you do for your job, uh, you need to be the best at that so that you continue to get raises and you, and you continue to move up the pay scale so that someday you, you're, 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 your expenses are $10,000 a month, but you're making 15. Now you've got an extra 5,000 or mm. you need to partner up with somebody uh, to help fund an investment, or you get a second job, whatever. But this is just this is just life, you but know. Chris, you... If if that's the case, thank you so much, by the way. And uh, so basically, are you saying? Are we all saying? I mean, the way the world is going is that we have to think out of the box sometimes, and we also think of having a second job and a third job in order to make that investment and that savings and that thought process and the safety net from for your retirement well i don't know i mean that's an individual thing so people have you know everybody has got they've got income and they've got expenses and everybody has to live within it within those um expenses and what i guess what you're describing is that there's somebody who there's absolute so they they make ten thousand dollars a year and they can there's no way that they can ever make any more than that hmm. uh, I, I don't know what to say about that yeah 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 thank you thank you so much chris so let me ask you this here. What does business mean to you according to your book and according to you itself? Yeah. Well, so um, my, my business is investing. I don't, I don't make widgets. I don't sell other than my book. I don't sell any products. So my business is investing and, and I, and I set up uh, business entities to do my investing because that provides advantages in terms of asset protection and tax benefits. Mm -hmm. So I'm treated, if, if Chris Odegaard goes out and invests, I'm treated one way by the IRS. If Chris Odegaard sets a up a company and that company makes the investment, the IRS treats that company differently than it does me and it treats it better. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, 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 you know, uh, to your, kind of previous question about well, how, where does where do people come up with more money well the low hanging fruit is taxes most people are paying way too much in taxes because they haven't taken the time to either partner up with somebody who's really good with taxes or or read a book like tax free wealth from a guy named Tom Wheelwright who's the smartest tax guy in the country because the what Tom would say is that the tax code 95% of the tax code is telling you how to pay less taxes. You just have to do the things that the government wants you to do that the government thinks is good for the country and the economy. One of those things is real estate. Another one is energy. Now, if you go put your money in the mutual funds in a 401k, the government's not going to reward you for that. But they are going to in, in, uh, reward you if, you if you provide affordable housing for people. Or, uh, you know, if you're involved in exploring or, or doing something with either fossil fuels or, or green energy, they're mm. going to reward you from a tax standpoint. That's mm. the one of the easiest ways to keep more of your money is to pay less in taxes. Mm. Yeah, Chris, thank you. Thank you again for that. What does what does technology mean to you? Oh, technology is awesome. <laughs> I mean, okay. we're living we're living in the, the greatest time to be alive when you. Uh, it's, um, you know, it's so, there's so much free information out there. If you want to change your life or change the direction of what you're doing, whether it's in your job or investing, man, all you got to do is get on the internet and search for it. And you'll find somebody like you or me who's already done something and, and they'll tell you how to do it. 
That's and it's right. out there. And for the most of it, I mean, it's, it's all free. And what you had to go through, you know, 20 years ago to do the kinds of things I'm doing now and that I can just learn while I'm, you know, shaving in the morning, uh, it's just incredible. So uh, I, I love it. And I have, uh, I have, uh, well, a, a young adult children, uh, yeah. but I, they're, they're great because, you know, if they tell me something new about technology that I don't know, I'm on it. Right. Cause I want to, yeah. I, I want to learn it. Yes, and, of, uh, course, of course. You know, technology is yeah. doubling every 18 months. And if you think you can, you'll be able to uh, still function in the world five years in, uh, from now and not pay attention to technology. I think you're mistaken. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, thank you again, Chris. You know, the reason why I asked this question is I want people to understand, to think out of the box. And that's mm -hmm. where that technology comes in to help you with your new skill. Because, you know, your your skill that you think that is a hobby could be a weapon for you for your next investment, investment mm -hmm. to yourself. I mean, that, that's why I asked that question. Now, what does marketing uh, mean to you? Well, marketing, uh, the best definition I ever heard of marketing is being on the mind of the customer when they're ready to buy. That's that's the definition of marketing that I think is just perfect. Uh, and that's why established companies are, you know, you would, why does Coca-Cola need to advertise, right? I mean, they've been around for over 100 years. Well, uh, there's competitors out there. And when, when that person wants to buy a soft drink, Coca-Cola wants that to be the thing that 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 comes to mind. That's why re repetition is, you know, you can't just put one thing out there and, you know, it's just over and over and over again. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Chris, th thank you again for that. And before you leave today, let me, let me ask you this. Is there a book that you, that you read all the time? It could be mystery. It could be business or it could be anything that intrigues you besides your, your asset book. <laughs> my ass book um, <laughs> well you know uh i i try to uh i try to uh you know once a year or so reread or listen to uh, rich dad poor dad um i i am on kind of a uh i'm kind of on a u.s history kick right now and i'm, I'm doing something that most people would find very boring i'm reading and studying the declaration of independence and the constitution and all the founding documents of the country because i I think the, the all the debates on various topics that are going on are very, 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 very interesting. And in some cases, uh, there's a lot of things being said that just don't make a lot of sense when you look at the founding of the country and, and you know, what the, the law of the land, what the Constitution says. So I thought, I think I should be smarter than this. And then maybe I could, you know, uh, I'd be in a better position to, you know, have some you know, interesting and, you know, valuable discussions with people. So I'm, I'm, I'm really, and I'm really enjoying that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you again, Chris, for, for that. You know, before you leave today, uh, I want your input as to how your journey was on back to basics. And do you have any last words to all my back to basic uh, listeners? <sighs> um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's uh, I, I like uh, I like what you're doing, and I think the the problem is is that we live in a we live in a complicated world, and it's it's kind of hard to uh, uh, sometimes navigate uh, everything. But um, you know, I, I still you know sometimes I look at technology and I go, God, has this has this made my life easier or has it made it more complicated? And I think it and I think it's a mix, but I think overall. It's, it's really allowed us to do a whole lot of things. And I guess everybody's just got to figure out, you know, kind of, you know, what's going to make their life uh, easier. Because at the end of the day, I think the technology is supposed to be here to serve me. I'm not supposed to be a slave to it. So uh, I think everybody's got to kind of figure that out for themselves. And I'm, you know, constantly trying to figure out how to, how to simplify my life and, and free up and free up my time. Mm -hmm. Chris, thank you. Thank you again for coming on the show. You know, this is, you are the first episode for season three, and I'm very, very honored for you to be here on the uh, Back to Basic Mode on, on the business uh, uh, podcast. Uh, so thank you again for supporting me, and thank you again for, for coming here. And uh, we talked last year, you know, many, many months ago, and, and here we are, 
on season three. It's just amazing. Thank you so much for that. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. I'm I'm honored to be the first guy for season three. So that's cool. Yeah. Thank thank you so much. And uh, please uh, keep on supporting me. And when you come up with that second book and the third book, whatever that is, please do contact us. Uh, we love to go and chat with you about what the previous uh, asset used to be and the new <laughs> one is going to be on. Right, right. Yeah, absolutely. I will do. Thanks. Thank you so much. So guys, we spoke with Chris today and we talked about the basics of assets. Yes, that's right. And we talked about the investments, if it is a risk taking or it's not. Well, that's up to you to decide what the episode is all about. And and it's not about to me. It's about all the information that I give. And that's what Chris is doing. Now, there's obviously a quote of the day from Back to Basics, that very first quote for season three. And I hope uh, Chris will like that quote. And the quote is going to be a little funny and a little not. So you have to go and be a judge of that. I will tell you how to become rich. Close the door. Be fearless. Fearful. When others are greedy, be greedy. When others are fearful. So guys, as usual, as always, what do we always say at the end of the episode for Back to Basics? Everything in life goes back to basics. And that's what we did today, guys. Guys, take care. God bless. Keep on supporting me on all the episodes because I do release every day on all four podcasts. And this is your love and support. And this is why it's so successful. And by the way, I didn't even tell anyone this. I'm really enjoying season three so far. And it's just the first episode. Guys, take care. God bless. And I'll see you next time on Back to Basics. Thank you, guys. Hi, guys. Thank you again for tuning in to Back to Basics and listening to the the excellent uh, episode that we had today with our guest you know with your love and support we do need you to at least rate our show review our show because it does make us stronger day by day week by week as i usually say on my episodes and there are three things in this episode that it makes a hit for me which is the content the guest and definitely the host so guys take care god bless and remember Everything in life goes back to basics, and that's what we did today, guys. Guys, take care. God bless, and see you next time on Back to Basics.